Hello and welcome to the 165th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a deep out across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's up, man? Um, if you are a quarterback and you want a good metro school to play for, come on by. Come on by. Uh, Matt, you and I were talking Friday night, and uh, Matt, Matt is quite the recruiter, I should say. So, uh, But it's glad to, glad to be here. I can't wait for the questionable coaching um, segment later on, and uh, it's going to be a good show. Well, there, there was some questionable coaching coming from all across the country this weekend. And uh, to get into that, we need the third amigo in the second city, a man who is primed for Oktoberfest season. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. Yeah, it was. I was at an Oktoberfest just this last weekend, but a little bit of information. The last time five or more teams in the Big Ten had a bye week was 1909, gentlemen. A major snowstorm hit Chicago. I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, this prevented train travel for Iowa visiting Northwestern. Uh, University of Chicago, Big Ten team at the time, could not leave the city to get up to Minnesota. Illinois was traveling up to Madison, and the trains go through Chicago. So they couldn't make the trip. And believe it or not, all six of those teams having games canceled allowed Michigan to win their first ever Big Ten title with a league record of 3-1-1. One, and one. The Gophers came up just short, going 2-1-1. One, and one. Uh, This was Michigan's breakthrough season. It, it resulted in an uptick of Interest in the sport, fans, administration, things like that. Was that a, was that a Fielding Yost team? It was, and, and this helped establish the, the Michigan dynasty. Uh, those of you that know Big Ten football know that Michigan won seven titles from 1911 to 1920. Uh, this, of course, was all made up. I had no interest in looking up the last time five Big Ten teams had the week off. And if you found that funny at all, uh, that's actually from my own week five preview. So that's a shameless self-promotion to start the show right there. Well, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> I just really like that I made that up. I do a random musing for my uh, preview each week. And this week's I was especially proud of. Uh, my dad was totally fooled when he read it. He was like, I was up. I was with you with every word until I – confess that it's not true the only, the, only, the only reason i would have questioned that was because i i thought michigan's first title under feeling yost was in like 1902 or 1903 that's why i was questioning yeah. then i think it's like, <laughs> like that that's the only thing that threw me off <laughs> so i mean it, it's it seems believable it, it's quite but, believable but it was, I, I see like it second was, weekend in november yeah so it was all lies anyhow um, before we get to some of the big games and our deep roots, uh, we have to get through some quick slants. And we usually do our recap of spread formations, but we were so garbage again this weekend that I'm just going to blow right through that <laughs> and uh, get right on top of my super high horse. Ooh, good. So, you know, in lieu of recapping our hemorrhaging wallets, I wanted to talk about something much more serious that needs to be discussed. Uh, In case you haven't heard, this past weekend, UMass head coach Mark Whipple was suspended uh, today because of language he used during a post-game press conference following their team's loss to Miami of Ohio. Uh, Trigger warning here, uh, I will use some not super graphic language, but uh, graphic language nonetheless. He used the term rape to describe an officiating non-call that he disagreed with on what he believed should have been a pass interference call uh, later in the game. This is terrible, obviously, but it's even more egregious considering the fact that the head referee for the game and the one whose choice it was to go with the non-call was Amanda Sauer, who is the first female official in the history of both the MAC and the Big Ten. Now, both Whipple and the UMass athletic director, Ryan Bamford, have issued the quotidian mealy mouth statement about his comments saying that, you know, he, obviously he didn't mean it and he's sorry for it, blah, blah, blah. But at this point in time, that's basically a perfunctory duty for coaches, ADs, athletic departments, uh, when we have some sort of run-in like this. Part of his punishment is to undergo mandatory sensitivity, tra- sensitivity training. And while I'm glad that 
Whipple will undergo that. My bigger takeaway from this whole incident is that it reminded me how prevalent the same culture of toxic masculinity is in college football. We've seen this happen again and again and again. Baylor, Michigan State, Ohio State, so many other schools. And well, we, we saw it happen with Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M this weekend, too. Yep. Yeah, I think that's it, that, that's maybe a different kid in the face. Yeah, I think that's a. I think that is maybe a, a different branch of the same tree. But uh, going back to this, this is just a man, another manifestation of this larger issue. It's never okay to use the language of sexual assault and sexual violence when discussing what is, at the end of the day, a game. Anyone who spent more than five minutes in any locker room knows that the language and lexicon used by players and coaches is, shall we say, colorful. But In my opinion, there is a definitive line that has been placed in contemporary society on the back of the Me Too movement when it comes to discussing rape and sexual assault. So, Coach, this is kind of where I want to bring you in, because one of the things that you constantly preach on the show is culture. So I want to get your thoughts on not just this situation, but how to create a program culture at large that does not run into these kinds of issues and has a much more, you know, forward thinking and appropriate uh, use of language and metaphor and just overall worldview when it comes to not just approaching the game, but approaching life in general. Well, I mean, obviously it starts at the top. I mean, as a head coach, you have to model that and not go out and say, hey, the rape, the, the refs raped us and he was molested on that play and he was, you know, things like that. Like I've, I've heard those terms being used. Or if you're a head coach, you can't go and punch your kids in the face, essentially, like Jimbo did on national TV. You have to, as a head coach, you have to model it. And then it goes down the chain to your assistant. They have to model it. If if there's something that you don't want your players to do, you have to model it and do it yourself. If you if you want to clean up the language, you have to clean up your own language first, and then they will catch on. All right. Now I understand that in a in a just an overwhelming testosterone driven sport, you're not going to eradicate all of it because when you get a bunch when you get 120 guys in the room at the same time and they're showering and doing you know whatever it is they do in a locker room together yeah there's going to be some some stuff that that happens in the locker room that should stay in the locker room you know that's just you know that's just part of the unavoidable thing but you have to you know but by saying what mark whipple said or by doing what jimbo said you're making that okay to do it outwardly and you're saying that okay it is okay to make light of sexual assault. I'm not saying make light, but it is okay to use that as a reference point when there's so many other words you could use, when there's so many other synonyms you could use right there for, uh, you know, essentially getting hosed by the referee um, or getting, you know, whatever. As a head coach, you have to be better than that. You can't, I know in your mind, you're probably, you're probably saying way worse things, but you can't verbalize that stuff. And, he just has to be aware of what he's doing and, and the example that he's setting because he says it in a press conference. Now, if I'm sitting in that locker room, I'm thinking, well, if it's good enough for him to say, it's good enough for me to say, you know? And, and, and I've noticed that when, when I – sometimes I cuss a little too much on the football field. I, I, will, I will go out and admit that I cuss a little too much. And I don't like it when the players cuss. I don't like it when they cuss excessively. I, I understand every once in a while it's a heated game. It's going to happen. But, um, you know, I have to then back up and say, okay, what am I doing to, to fix this problem? If I don't cuss, maybe I can hold them to that standard, and then we can, you know, because then they start cussing in class. Then they start cussing in the hallways. Then they start talking to their girlfriends or their peers in a certain way. And they start talking to their parents in a certain way. Next thing you know, they're out of control. So he's got to, you know, I say all of that to say it starts at the top. He's got to model the behavior that he wants. And if you think that's okay, then that's on you. If you think that's okay, then there's something much. uh, There's something deeper and and that's on you. it's It's a much larger issue than just the verbiage that you're using, Josh. Exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I swear like a sailor as a fan, and, uh, you know, I think there's a difference bet- bet- between saying, you know, what the F was that call by Brian Ferentz? We're playing like ass. I mean, that's vulgar, but uh, it doesn't really degrade anybody or, you know, offend in the way that the word Mark Whipple used. That word is a crime perpetrated as a power act and overwhelmingly perpetrated against women. I think that with a female ref, he was saying it deliberately. I completely agree. I think that is the underreported. I, I think that's the underreported part of the story. Because I think he is trying to put her in her place if she ever officiates another UMass football game again. Uh, so I think that was a very deliberate word choice. And when it comes to like offensive language that just crosses the line, uh, there's two R words, there's a C word, and there's a certain F word. Those four, I have, you know, tossed out of my vocabulary um, back in, like, high school, quite honestly. And if a knucklehead guy like me, who uh, grew up at a pretty, uh, let's just say, narrow viewpoint in the state of Iowa, uh, we didn't see many of certain people, um, you know, and also the N-word I've actually never said in my life. Uh, So four words I cut out entirely by the time I was in high school and one word I was raised to never ever say and it's just because those are offensive triggering words and you know Mark Whipple he is an old dude he coached at Massachusetts for a really long time and that's going to probably be his excuse people are going to say well you know he's an old school guy whatever whatever Um, you can teach dogs new tricks We've seen it before. Mark, Mark Whipple was doing it deliberately, and I, I don't think his suspension's long enough. Uh, quite frankly, his record is terrible as it is. I think UMass missed an opportunity to make a bold statement and just fire him immediately. Absolutely. And I don't know what the relationship between Mark Whipple and Ryan Bamford is like. But Maybe they should just transfer him to, to Rutgers. <laughs> No, I, I certainly hope uh, Rutgers would not would not want him. But with uh, yeah. with, the, with the state of Rutgers football, that's a different story for a different day. But I just I wanted to talk about that at the top because that was something that was really bugging me this weekend, especially like Josh said, you know, the fact that it was a female referee and it was clearly clearly pointed at her. And I think that is just another manifestation of the toxic masculinity and inherent sexism that we see in the game. And that there definitely are coaches and programs out there that are trying to uh, combat this and that are trying to do the right thing. But we've seen over and over again, whether it's Mark Whipple or Urban Meyer or the entire Baylor administration, that you know this uh, sort of... Uh, caveman ideology is still prevalent and it's still around and we need more people like coach quite frankly who are cognizant of this and making changes not just at the college level but this starts back at youth football this starts with you know peewee coaches uh modeling the proper behavior and things like that and uh, his well yeah and and the thing is his even if he had used different language, the fact that he's blaming the refs totally gets away from the fact that Ohio put up over 660 yards on his team. His team rushed for 41 yards on 22 carries, while Ohio rushed for almost 400 yards. He lost by 16 points. His team was beat pretty soundly and they, yeah, they had 30 more penalty yards than Ohio. I mean, it's not like it was 150 penalty yards to one. It, it, it was a joke. I, I don't know what Whipple is talking about. Um, you know, I've already said it. I thought he should have been fired. I stand by that. 
Coach brought up Jimbo Fisher. Now, that's something a little different to me because, um, you know, I didn't see all of it. I just saw the clip kind of out of context. And Fisher says that he was trying to prevent him from, you know, engaging in a fight. Maybe that's true. I don't know what happened before the specific clip because I didn't see much of that game. And the player, I know it's a weird power dynamic with your coach and your other player. The player doesn't have a problem with it. Uh, it's a bad visual. It's old school. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, grabbing a player's face mask to get their attention feels feels uh, on this scale of what's right or wrong in college football to me is, is a 0. 0.5. It, it, it's way less egregious than what Whipple did. Well, yeah, but I mean – I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to compare them apples and apples here. I mean, this is obviously apples and oranges. But yeah. this one was also uh, not on as big of a scale. Obviously, um, was, was another one of the just come on, man. You got to be sp- you got to be better than that. You got to be smarter than that. Because there's there's other ways to without punching your player in the face. There's other ways to, to to get his attention. You know, if they're trying to fight, I mean, they have this whole like chest plate on their shoulder pads. You know, you just like, you know, you just you know, hit their chest or like push them away with the chest or like grab their shoulder pads and just kind of lead them away, you know? And, and I've done that before. Like you, you know, cause we've had kids fight. Um, obviously we had, we had a whole, basically a full scale brawl that broke out, um, between our team and the other team. And so instead of running in and hitting people's face masks, you just kind of pull them out. You grab their shoulder pads and pull them away or push them away. And then, you know, or you, you pull a Jeff Van Gundy and grab them by the ankles and, and ride, ride them. Like, or, or you do a Woody Hayes and you punch the opponent, not your own player. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> th- there's better. I mean, I understand that it's not as egregious of a, of, of a deal, but th- there's better ways to handle that too, because. Well, because especially what, what happens when you put your hands on the student athlete. Well, what happens if the switch situation is flipped and that student athlete puts his hand on the coach? Yeah. Then, then we're then, talking something different. Then that guy's getting expelled from school. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you know, we have a whole lot of other fallout from that. And we're having a completely different conversation. It, it's almost like, it's almost a power thing. Like, Hey, I can, I can pretty much punch your face mask. Yeah. To get your attention. Now there, there's ways that, old school methods that I don't mind of getting your attention. You grab, you, you, you kind of hook your finger on the bottom of the face mask and you just kind of give a little tug. And that gets, that's, that's the, that's how you use the face mask to get the attention. You just, you just grab the very bottom of it and you give it a, you give it a decent tug and just kind of gets there. You know, okay. It shakes them up. And, and that's, you know, if, if we're saying old school methods that are, that are okay, you know that's probably your line right there. You just kind of, just kind of grab it and give it a nice little tug and say, "Hey, I'm down." You know, look at me, real quick, um, type deal. Not what Jimbo did. So, you know, but if we're, if we're obviously if we're comparing them, you know, Mark Whipple is is way worse because he deliberately used the word rape and he deliberately also used the word mugged. Which is also um, to a female ref is also extremely inappropriate. Well, it's, it's, it's inappropriate to anyone, races. whether it's male or female. Whatever. I just think that it's it's even more egregious because of who the head official was in this. Yeah, case. That, that's that's yeah, that's, so. that's what I'm saying. So, um, a, a bunch of like it's like huge black stain, huge just big old black eye on what I thought was a pretty good weekend of college football. All right. Well, with that, let's get to this weekend of college football with some quick (laughs) slants. Uh, Josh, I will throw it out to you first. All right. Well, I'm doing a really quick rundown of our two smaller conferences because they don't always get to make our show. So starting with the Conference USA out in the east, we got Marshall, Florida International, and Middle Tennessee, each opening 1-0 and in league play. The Herd are sitting pretty for a bowl at 3-1. and Charlotte's improvement is in parrot with a 1-1 and league start and 2-3 and overall start. 
FAU and Western Kentucky are each 0-1 as the lost a thriller to Middle Tennessee. It's still a surprising 2-3 and three mark so far. Old Dominion has the biggest win of the year in this conference, but amazingly, that Virginia Tech upset is the Monarchs' only victory in their 1-4, and 0-2 start. Out West, Louisiana Tech got a huge win over North Texas to improve to 3-1, and 1-0. and UAB, Southern Miss, and UTSA are also 1-0. and North Texas, 4-1, and but now must play catch-up to win the division. Rice and UTEP were expected to be bad, and they are, as the Owls are 1-4 and and the Miners are 0-5. My biggest takeaway from this conference is with the two favorites, FAU and North Texas, sitting at 0-1, their margins of error are reduced. And the door for a good club like Marshall or Louisiana Tech is opened up. And then down in that Sun Belt, Troy has ripped off four straight wins, including a 2-0 start in league play, and they look like the cream of the crop in this league. Although, don't sleep on App State, Georgia Southern, or even Georgia State, who's 1-0 in league and have all looked at times like clubs that could play spoilers to the Trojans. Coastal Carolina is also hanging tough at 1-1 and 3-2 and and overall. In a much better season than last year, and a lot of that has to be head coach Joe Moglia returning from a health absence last season. Out West, uh, this division is really struggling with 1-1 one and one South Alabama currently leading things, but they're just 1-4 and four overall in this season. Arkansas State, Louisiana, and Texas State are all 0-1 but we would probably all assume that the Red Wolves will get going again after a tough crossover date at Georgia Southern last week. Uh, Louisiana Monroe, they have dug themselves a hole at 0-2 this far. The East race, it's going to be amazing. So check out the Sun Belt. But quite frankly, unless something changes and the Red Wolves get going, it looks like the inaugural Sun Belt title game could be a snoozer. All right. Uh, Coach, we don't have any uh, real SEC games in our, uh, besides one, the Dan Mullen Bowl, in our deep roots. But there are a bunch of other undercard games this weekend that provided plenty of intrigue. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, just look at just look at the game in Athens, uh, Tennessee, trying to come off what was a total embarrassment um, last weekend against Florida. Uh, actually, put up a pretty good fight. Uh, they they're showing that they made the right hire in Jeremy Pruitt. They're just showing that, hey, maybe if we just be a little patient with this guy, we will uh, will actually be pretty good. They competed very, very well. But Georgia, um, last week after uh, this, you know, it's hard to say you're disappointed after um, a huge win on the road like that, but they were disappointed that, that they didn't run. Kirby Smart was disappointed that Georgia didn't run as well as he wanted them to. So uh, they came out firing all cylinders in the run game, rushing for 251 yards. Holyfield led the way, 16 carries, 78 yards. Uh, DeAndre Swift scored twice. Uh, Justin Fields actually got significant action. Uh, he provided what, what Kirby said was a spark in the dog's offense. He scored twice on the ground as well. Um, Jake Fromm looked looked solid in the passing game. But uh, one of the things to look for uh, with this Georgia team is this offensive line, which comes in which came into the season as a strength, actually is playing with a lot of youth right now due to due to a couple of injuries, uh, especially one to uh, Andrew Thomas. So um, Cade Mays got his first start uh, at one of the guard positions, and uh, so they were young and not quite in sync, and pass pro kind of suffered there. So uh, it was actually a really good game, a uh, really fun game to watch. Uh, it started out looking like Georgia was going to run away with it, then Tennessee fought, clawed their way back in, and then Georgia slammed the door with a uh, – a, their, I think it was right in the middle of the fourth quarter, uh, about eight minutes to go. They get the ball, and they, they, they just promptly – chew about six and a half minutes off the clock and score. So um, a very good, exciting game to watch, but Georgia won 38-12. Bama struggled or struggled to find good competition. Uh, 56-14 was the final there. Wasn't all bad for Louisiana Lafayette. The Raging Cajuns did have a a ball carrier go over 100. Uh, Trey Raggis, 16 carries, 111 uh, for the Raging Cajuns. Also, Tua was 8 of 8 for 128 and two touchdowns before they said, all right, you're good uh, for the rest of the day. So, um, you know, again, probably spent too much time on that. Um, one of the games that we thought was going to be a really good barn burner, uh, really good uh, sleeper matchup, ended up being a route LSU. Uh, just rolled, steamrolled Ole Miss 
45-16. Joe Burrow was 18 of 25 for 292 and three touchdowns. He was also the leading rusher with nine carries, 96 yards, and a touchdown. So uh, without – it was actually all Joe Burrow for the Tigers. Uh, Auburn and what was probably the longest game of the college football season thus far, and probably if you look at the history books, probably one of the longest games ever. They had some significant weather delays. Uh, they were victorious 24-13 to 13 over Southern Miss. I don't hold that against them because of all the delays, but let's just say Auburn has probably one of the worst offensive lines I've seen uh, roll through Auburn in quite some time. Uh, Kentucky continues its hot streak with a huge 24-10 to 10 win over the South Carolina Gamecocks. Uh, Benny Snell, 28 carries, 99 yards, and a touchdown. Uh, Jade Bentley was 13-28, 148, and a touchdown, uh, but just could not – uh, do enough with Debo Samuels. Uh, he was he was held to only two catches, but those two catches went for 61 yards and a touch. So Kentucky looking to uh, – it's it's looking more and more like their showdown with Georgia and Lexington here in November is going to be for the Eastern title. So uh, let's see if the, the Cats can keep their, uh, their streak alive here. Uh, the Mullen Bowl we'll talk about. Uh, I don't want to bury the lead, Josh. Make sure I don't bury the lead, but – uh, Texas. Yeah, I think you. I think you covered all the SEC games. I can't think of a single other one that was in action. Yeah. Um, Me so Texas, Texas A&M, uh, they they struggled uh, against Arkansas. They they uh, they came away with a with a seven point win, twenty four seventeen over the over Wu Pig Suey. But uh, for Wu Pig, I, I think Coach, I think you might have that wrong. My notes show that uh, Texas A&M actually played Arkansas Pine Bluff. Oh, my bad. So, my bad. Yeah, I, th- I think so, the Razorbacks. I think the Razorbacks were off. I'll look into it. I'll get back to you guys later on the show. And I th- look into. There's a couple of. Uh, there's a there's a kid that committed somewhere in that general vicinity uh, named Trey Knox. Uh, I can't remember if it was Arkansas <laughs> or maybe it was Arkansas Monticello. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, U A L R. Yeah, there you go. Um, the the story of the SEC though uh, comes in a uh, in a sad note. Vanderbilt's thirty one twenty seven victory over the Tennessee State Tigers that came with uh, a bit of a sad story. Christian Abercrombie was taken off the field by a stretcher. He was moved to Vanderbilt University Medical Center after collapsing with a head injury um, that required surgery. So um, he's still in serious condition at Vanderbilt Hospital, and uh, so the prayers are uh, from, from this area are with him, and prayers nationwide are with Christian Abercrombie, too. Um, so uh, that that injury just kind of puts into perspective that this still is just a game, and it's a dangerous game. And so, you know, you have to, you know, be as safe as you possibly can. So uh, that's just kind of what happened uh, in the SEC. A very – a very good week. Um, very, uh, if, if you're Kentucky, if you are uh, LSU, if you're Georgia, and of course if you're Alabama, um, very bad week uh, conference-wise. If you're Mississippi State or South Carolina um, or Arkansas, uh, Little Rock, Little Rock. There you go. There you go. All right. Well. Coach talked about the SEC. I want to talk about the Pac-12 really quick. So we'll talk. I'll talk here as fast as possible about some Pac-12 games that we're not going to be covering in deep roots. I'll start in Seattle, where BYU couldn't upset a second UW on the road this season. Jake Browning was super efficient for the Huskies, 92% completion rate, and Washington held the Cougars to 194 total yards in that 35-7 victory. Oregon, coming off of their heartbreaking defeat to Stanford, headed to Berkeley, where they rode their defense to a 42-24 victory. The Ducks had five takeaways, including two defensive scores. And Justin Herbert, again, looked excellent against a defense that we all thought was pretty solid. For Cal, they looked perplexed at times on offense, Obviously, I mentioned the five turnovers, and uh, neither of their two quarterbacks found any sort of rhythm in this game. Two of the other mediocre teams in the Pac-12 South faced off in Tucson, and despite trying as hard as possible to give this one away, the Trojans ended up victorious over Arizona 24-20. to Khalil Tate still does not seem comfortable at all in Kevin Sumlin's offense, and the Wildcats ended up losing three fumbles in the game. But USC racked up the penalties in this one, 18 flags for 169 yards, which was equivalent to about 35% of their total 
total offensive production for the day. Uh, neither of these teams have really impressed me that much so far. Finally, up on the Palouse, uh, the battle for second place in my Pac-12 heart. Uh, Washington State came out on top 20-24 to over Utah. This was perhaps the Mike Leachiest performance of all Mike Leach games. Can I interest anyone in 445 passing yards and zero rushing yards? Uh, good times all around. Utah has still not been able to find a useful passing game, despite it being Tyler Hartley, Huntley's second year as the starting quarterback. I picked Utah to win the Pac-12 South at the start of the season, and I'm still not writing them off. I'm still not going to get off of that bag, bandwagon just yet, but uh, they are behind the eight ball at this point, and they have to be wary of, of all teams, Colorado, who looks like they actually might be the best team in that division. They are uh, undefeated at this point, and their passing attack looks excellent, although they played UCLA this week, who is uh, rebuilding is about the kindest way you can possibly put it. So they've been putting up some big yeah, points. Just, well, just an extra note on Colorado. Uh, I did not put them into my poll this week, and the reason is Colorado State, Nebraska, and UCLA, those are their three FBS wins. Anyone care to guess how many combined win those th- wins those three teams have? They're like 1 in 14 combined or something. Correct. Uno, Colorado State's one win. Which, Everyone beat, which yeah. Colorado's one win, gosh, who did they beat? I don't even remember who they beat in their one win either. Colorado State? Yeah. Oh, they uh, let me let me look. Let me look. Uh, we might be burying it. I'm trying to find it. Uh, uh, that'd be Arkansas. There you have it, folks. <laughs> that your 2018 uh, Arkansas Racerbacks. <laughs> well, uh, before we hit the deep roots, time for a pop quiz, guys. Take out your number two pencils, scantrons, and blue books. Uh, we've talked about some big offenses so far. And so there are, at this point in the season, 12 teams that are averaging 45 points per game or better. Your job is to name those 12 teams. Coach, I'll throw it to you first. Ooh. um, (laughs) Well, I'm going to go with Alabama. That would be a good place to start. They're number one in the country, averaging 54.2 yards per, uh, 54.2 points per game. Well, mine is my defending national champion. They're up to the uh, top five in my poll, and that'd be the Knights, UCF. It helps when you get to play Connecticut. Uh, yeah, 48.8 <laughs> points per game. Quick note on Connecticut, they are dead last in the country in uh, points allowed per game at fifty at over 53, and dead last in yards allowed per game at 663 per game. Well, we talked about we talked about it last week. We might have been off the air. We might have already stopped recording it. But one thing we're going to look at is which program gives up more points per game. Not total points because the season's way longer. But does Connecticut basketball or does Connecticut football give up more points per game? That I think be, I think those one problem. Problem. Well, also, I think those UConn women, they are so good that they might hold their opponents in the 40s. Oh, if it's, if it's the women's team, absolutely. <laughs> if it's the women's team, oh, 100%. Well, we'll do both basketball programs. Uh, I, I think the women's team would flat out just beat the men's team at this point. But that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> Coach, what's your next guest? Well, it's not Kansas, so I'm going to go with the next best thing, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, number eight in the country, 48.6 points per game. Uh, it helped that there was a game recently that featured the two top scoring offenses, and that was Penn State was one of them. And I That's think cool. I gave Coach the other one. Uh, 49.6 points per game for Penn State, good for fifth in the country. So it's not UConn, right? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go with Ohio State. Ohio State, that would be a good guess. Number six, 49 points per game. Well, the uh, the Ole Miss game is a little scary, and they were below this, obviously, against West Virginia. Uh, but I'm pretty sure in their two wins, Texas Tech put up a ton of points. So I'm going to say the Red Raiders are still above that threshold. Yeah, Red Raiders, three and two, and they are averaging 48.4 points per game, good for ninth in the country. All right. Um, 
I want to say there's another Big 12 team that, that I'm thinking, um, but I, I don't think they're quite there just yet. But I will say the other one I was thinking, I had a kind of a kind of a coin flip here. So I'm going to say, how about them Cowboys? Mm. Oh, them Cowboys fall just short, 44.4 oh. points per game. They are 13th, but it's only the top 12 that make it. Mm. Mm. So uh, my next pick makes me a little nervous because thanks to their schedule, they've actually already played 14 games somehow. But every time I see their score on the bottom line, it seems like it's a pretty high number. So we go with the Rainbow Warriors. Rainbow Warriors, good choice. Not quite there, though. 42 points per game for Hawaii. Good for 22nd in the country. All right. Here's another team from the same conference that I see outrageous numbers from, and that would be the Boise State Broncos. Boise State, oh, 43.3 points per game, just short. They are 18th in the country. But I will tell you, there is another Mountain West team uh, in the top 12. There is. Actually, I I take that back. There are two other Mountain West teams in the top 12. There's two Mountain West. Well, I've got some ideas. I'll circle back to that in a second. But uh, one team that I'm going to go with, uh, when I was preparing our show notes, I was obviously talking about the Sun Belt, and Appalachian State put up a ton of points against Penn State and has put up a bunch of points since. I'm pretty sure the Mountaineers are up around 50. Mountaineers, number three in the country, 51.8 points per game. You think about Appalachian State, you usually think about defense, but they're, you know, they're putting some big numbers on the scoreboard this year. Hmm. All right, all right, all right. <sighs> I'm having a hard time with this one. Um, I think I'm pretty much out, but I'm, I'm going to guess that other Mountain West team and say, how about them Bulldogs? Fresno, Fresno State. State. Good choice, Coach. 45 points per game, good for 11th in the country. I think they put up 77 points or 79 points maybe against Idaho in their opener. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that nice. does not hurt. No, it doesn't. Um, the Clemson game would not have helped them, but I think Syracuse is hovering around this mark. Ooh, that's a good guess, Josh. They are just short, 44.2 points per game. Good for 16th in the country. Ooh. Well, I'll tell you what, it's... it's uh... I'll tell you who it's definitely not, and that's uh, that's the Fighting Hats. <laughs> uh, I'll t- there, there are five teams left, guys. Five teams left. Five teams? Five teams. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the Palouse. And, and, no, I'm not going to go to the Palouse. <laughs> um, <laughs> if we go yards per game, I'm definitely going to the Palouse. But, uh, yeah, they're not quite there. Unfortunately, um, I'm gonna try to guess this other Mountain West team here. Uh, I'm gonna say so. It wasn't Boise. It wasn't Hawaii. Dang it! Who could it be? Who could it be? Utah State. Utah State's correct. They are fourth nice. in the nation. Fifty-one and a half points per game. Nice. Aggie's getting it done. All right. Um, Let's see. This team, I want to say they are a little bit uh, like Fresno in that I think they dropped 70 points on an FCS team, and I believe it's the Houston Cougars. The Houston Cougars are number two in the country, averaging 52.3 points per game. Who, who'd they blow out? They absolutely obliterated someone. Houston in uh, – correct, yeah. Not this past week they had a bye, but the week before that, they beat Texas Southern 70-14. to 14. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that. And have hit 45 in their other three games. Yeah. 45-45. Uh, uh, Brian, Brian Ferentz's offense is on pace to score 70 points this season. 
<laughs> All right, uh, guys, there are I got two left. Two left. Two left. Well, I can tell you it's not the uh, it's not the Blue Raiders of MTSU, but they were victorious twenty five twenty four over uh, Lord Kiffin. Um, let's see. Uh, what about? I'm gonna go with a wild card here. What about the Demon Deeks? Ooh, ooh, Wake Forest. Interesting call. Uh, Wake Forest is 29th in the country, 38.2 points per game. So a little bit shy, but that's not a bad guess. Wait, it's not put, bad. I see a lot of bad. I see a lot of big numbers from them. Hmm. I'm a tad concerned that coach hasn't said Georgia, so I'm going to skip them. Yeah, I'm going to go with the team that just put up some points on Texas Tech. I'll try the other Mountaineers. Let me let me go with West Virginia. West Virginia. Oh, oh, so close. 21st in the country, 42.3 points per game. They are one-tenth of a point per game behind Georgia, who is at 43.2. Hey, you, yeah, I, I, I know Georgia, there was, a, there was a game where they, I don't, I feel like that dropped their average significantly. But a uh, little fun fact, you know, when I said I was tossing up between two Big 12 teams and I said, how about them Cowboys? You want to know who the other team was? Mm. West Virginia. Nice. <laughs> I chose wisely. You um, so we got two teams left, right? And we each have two strikes? That is correct. Ooh. Oh, boy. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to choose wisely here. Okay. Hmm. Um, I, w- I will give you guys the conferences of the two teams left. One of them is a Pac-12 team. One of them is a MAC team. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, MAC is – the Mac one is definitely Brohio. Oh, sorry, Coach. Brohio is not the correct answer. Oh, Ohio that is was... averaging thirty nine point three points per game, good for twenty sixth in the country. Ohio was going to be my guess, but now that I think, but now that Ohio has been eliminated, um. I've seen Northern a couple times. They can't score. No, Northern, uh, in fact, is third to last in the country. They're averaging 16.4 yeah. points per game. Um, Ball State's just bad. Yep. Um, I saw Central Michigan against Michigan State. I cannot imagine that they're on pace to have a very good offense. Uh, Western Michigan is in shambles. Uh, Buffalo was just held to 13 points by Army, so they're probably out. We've guessed Ohio. Uh, Bowling Green is one of the worst teams in the entire country. They're out. Uh, Eastern Michigan has a gritty offense, but it's not very high scoring. Um, let's see. Who else is in the MAC? We got, ooh, Miami of Ohio is really not terribly impressive this season. Um, so that has me. Down to Akron, who I saw against Northwestern. They don't have much of an offense. And then the two other teams are Kent State, who's dreadful at football. So that by process of elimination, thanks to Coach having a 50-50 shot and coming up just short, I'm going to go with the Rockets. Toledo, that is correct. They are 12. Ooh. They are averaging exactly 45 points per game, thanks in part to two games where they've hit over 60 uh, nice. Six points against VMI. Bring yeah. us home, coach. Get that Pac-12 team. 63 points against Nevada. And their two losses, though, they scored on 24 and 27. Huh. All right, bring us home, coach. Get that, get that Pac-12 team, and we'll call it a draw. All right, Pac-12 team is definitely quack. No. Mm. Quack, quack, quack. Give me the quack, ducks. Quack, 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 Mr. Ducksworth, indeed. 45.6 points per game for the Ducks. Gentlemen, this is the first time in the history of the pop quiz we've gotten every answer before uh, either of you struck out. Well, it was it was very advantageous that Coach made a great guess of Ohio, and then as a total football nerd, I can list off the MAC teams off the top of my head. And that's the kind of information you come to a legal motion for. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, well done on the draw. Uh, Round of applause to you both. 
So with that, let's move into some deep roots. Uh, we'll start, obviously, with the biggest game of the weekend. Our feature game ended up being an all-timer. Ohio State came back in the second half to beat Penn State 27-26. to There are a million ways to dissect what happened in this one. But, Josh, let's start here. What kind of adjustments did Ohio State make after halftime to finally make themselves effective moving the ball against a Penn State defense that looked outstanding in the first half? Who? Uh, well, let's just say they found a way to get just better juice out of that passing game. Uh, Dwayne Haskins kind of put the team on his shoulder. Uh, he got it done. I, I mean, this is a team that we've talked about all their electric running backs and and how you know how would Haskins respond in the uh, the environment of the whiteout, and I think it was pretty clear that Penn State was like, hey, we're going to let this kid beat us because they gave nothing to Dobbins. They gave nothing to Mike Weber. They gave nothing to Paris Campbell. And Haskett said challenge accepted. And so uh, I just think they had a little bit better all-around passing attack in that second half. They Their blocking looked a little bit better in the second half. Uh, I thought some of their play calling uh, was a better was a little bit better, and just looked like the receivers were running crisper routes, and and just all of it worked to their advantage. Uh, Coach, obviously, you know there was a lot that happened in this game, but Josh, I know that your questionable coaching choice for the week comes from this one. Yeah, I mean, how can you not? You you get the that last minute play. Um, taking the two timeouts before it, um, running that fourth down play, that was just asinine. Um, You know, Coach Franklin's admitted to it. But uh, I was just curious what Coach thought because he is an offensive coordinator. And, you know, Franklin said he saw something. But, Coach, you have a a good passing attack with your prep. In that scenario – what in the world could you possibly see to take the ball out of someone as good as Trace McSorley? Yeah, I don't know, especially especially when you know what got me the most was the just overall discombobulation uh, and changing the play with less than ten seconds on the play clock, and then you have to hurry up and and just snap it, and you got guys, you got blitzers in. A gap and B gap, and you've got basically what amounted to a five man line, and then you just give some stupid handoff, and I don't even think the offensive line really, uh, it just it it looked forced, it looked panicked. Uh, now what I would have probably done was uh, I have a really dynamic quarterback, and I have a really uh, I have a really good tight end that had been playing very well uh, that had just made a huge catch to put me in that position. Let's just say I probably run some sort of flood route, flood concept to the sideline, or I hit some sort of mesh because you, you've got fourth and five. So you, you just need five yards. So you probably just run a couple of crossing routes over the middle, take advantage of, of maybe a pick or maybe run like a pick play, do like a three by one and do like a double pick with an out route. And, and maybe just do something that I can get on the edge quick and get the ball out of my hands right away because, you know, they're bringing the house. If I see something like that, I'm checking something, you know, five yards over the middle or just something out to the alley because I know I'm getting a lot of middle pressure and there's no need to panic because I know exactly uh, if I've watched film, I know exactly kind of what they do in those type of situations, and I kind of figure out what what's what's happening, and I don't have to panic. I don't have to do some stupid run play that um, was never going to work in any circumstances. I don't care what you saw. Um, I just I don't like it. Uh, I, I I don't like taking the ball out of my best player's hands. Uh, things like that. I just that down in distance is very very tricky. You know, if it was fourth and two, and you and and you said you, you saw something, okay, I can buy that. If it's anything more than fourth and three, you, you you've got an all-American quarterback, use him. 
You've got a good tight end. Use him. You've got a receiver that made the catch of the freaking decade uh, with a one-handed snare earlier in the game. You've got him. Put him on a dig route. Put him on a on a on an out cut. Put him on something. You know, you know, if you throw it anywhere near him, he's going to come down with it. So I just I don't understand that you have so many options, so many guys that could possibly make a play for you, and you call two timeouts and that's what you do. We'll, we'll, re, we'll rewind it. We'll rewinding it even before you get to that play. Um, I think the third down call. Or excuse me, the second down call oh, is uh, not talked about enough. That you had, horrible. I mean, yeah, you why had. Not, um, why not go tempo and just freaking nickel and dime them down the field because they're on their heels? It would be like a, it'd be like I'm gonna use a boxing analogy here. Uh, so, so stick with me. It's like, it's like if you if you if you're punching your opponent and you've just got a series of quick jabs, why not just keep attacking them and quick jab, quick jab, quick jab, quick jab, and then all of a sudden wham, that last jab is going to knock them out. And, and and that's how you get down the field. You go tempo, get them on their heels, and just keep doing what you do. Yeah. And, and, and if you're and, going to run that play, that, that play is much better run from tempo than after having those two timeouts. Mm-hmm. I'm not actually disagreeing with the play call so much as I am disagreeing with the two timeouts in order to call that specific Yeah. Time. Well, the, 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 like I said, the thing that – I don't understand either is the second and um, what was it? Second at 14, I believe um, hmm. chucking at like 30 yards, trying to have a chunk play. I don't understand that. Like you said, coach run tempo, pick up six, seven yards. Then well, you have a third and seven. out there and get five of yeah. them back. Because you know you're in four down territory anyway, you you no. you know you're going for it. So why not use three downs to get 14 yards? I mean, no. it's not insurmountable. And then I, I mean, I think another decision that is also not getting enough scrutiny is uh, back closing stages of that third quarter, a fourth and one at the Buckeye 24. You're down 14, 13. It's the game has clearly been established as a nip and tuck defensive affair. Why are you coming, not quite red zone, but why are you coming away from a really nice drive with zero points? You get that there. You're up 14, 16. Let's say it plays out the exact same. Oh, I'll say punt. You score. You're up 14, 23. You then score again. You're up 14 to 30. If it plays the same, they left three points out there on that long drive. They had the missed field goal earlier in the game for, uh, back in, I think, the first quarter. But by that stage of the game, you're at home. Why are you chasing points? I don't understand that call either. No, I, I, I think in, in a tight game, and you know it's going to be tight, points are at a premium. And, and I think, you know, some some cases I, I love the aggressiveness, and, and I still do love the aggressiveness. It shows you have – you know, it shows you have confidence in your offensive line, and I've said that before. But in a game of that magnitude, it's not about having confidence in your offensive line. It's about, hey, let's just get some points. Our defense is playing playing well. Let's get some points and let's let's move on. And I think I would have I would have gone for the points in that situation. All right. Well, Josh, you have any final thoughts here on on this one before we move on to our next game? Well, this is two years in a row now where Penn State has totally choked away a big second-half lead, and uh, I think it's apparent that they can go toe-to-toe with Ohio State, and I think by admitting that the play was a bad call and stuff, I think Franklin started to look a little bit inward because I think at this point, you know, comparing Jims and Joes, the two programs look the same. So Penn State's got to be wondering, what are what are we doing at halftime or potentially what are we not doing at halftime that's allowing Ohio State to just go on crazy runs? Because this is now two years in a row that Penn State has had them essentially dead in the water and Ohio State comes from nowhere to win it. 
I, I, I think Ohio State found, found a way to neutralize that pass rush a little bit because Penn State's always kind of gotten a lot of pressure on them. And uh, I think they did well in the first half of just getting to Dwayne Haskins. And I think they did a few things. Uh, they scored, I believe, on a screen. Uh, one of their touchdowns was a screen to, to Dobbins. And I thought that was a really good call and really good adjustment to, to neutralize the pass rush. So there's, there's one thing. All right. Well, let's head to our next one where the Fighting Irish hosted Stanford on Saturday in South Bend, and they put on uh, a clinic in a, in a truly dominant performance against the Cardinal. Ian Book threw for four touchdowns, and Stanford's offense was, I'd say, pedestrian at best. Coach, what did Notre Dame do uh, that capped any of Stanford's big play guys, whether it's Bryce Love or Jaws? or Colby Parkinson or anyone else from really going off? Well, uh, with Ian Book doing what he did, they kind of forced Stanford to go one-dimensional and kind of forced Stanford out of their comfort zone. Uh, Book was just outstanding. And, you know, I think that just was a breath of fresh air and a spark for Notre Dame. I think it just kind of – I know it doesn't have a direct effect on the defense, but it the indirect effect of the defense saying, okay, well, we can – we can go be super aggressive now because we know Ian, Ian Book and, and, and our offense is going to get it done finally, and we don't have to play tight and try to bail them out. We can come after them. We can shut down Bryce Love. We can, we can blitz. We can do what we want to do instead of what we feel like we have to do to try to preserve a game. And Ian Book, you know, I just can't say enough good things about how he played in this game. I mean, Stanford is – they're seventh in the country, and Notre Dame just I, it, it it was it was like it was like they were practice almost at some time, some points, and it just he just looked very comfortable back there, and you know you, you just got to wonder why haven't we seen book sooner? But you know that's a different story for a, for a different day. But um, you know he uh, just again, I, I think that was probably one of the big one of the big keys was just Ian Book playing so well. Uh, Josh, what did, uh, you know, for you, what I uh, did anything that you actually, actually the way I'll put this is that, do you think Stanford was still a little bit hung over from the Oregon game? Maybe a little bit, but I mean, going on the road back to back week, it, it, it was, I know they ended up winning over Oregon, but it yeah. was, like, yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit. I, I think though, that we're starting to see a trend though, with Stanford this season and, uh, Wisconsin's had a little bit of it too, and, and that's just their offensive line is not as advertised. And uh, you know, Book was amazing, like Coach talked about, and Coach mentioned that his playmaking makes that defense be able to take a little bit more risks. Well, that defensive unit, five sacks, nine tackles for loss, four quarterback hurries. That's not what we're accustomed to for Stanford, and we're we're seeing it with. Costello under pressure. Bryce Love just cannot get going. He had 73 yards, but he had a long of 39. So the rest of his carries were pretty much nada. And look, Stanford, you, your offensive line has got to somehow find a way to get it into gear. The The best thing, at least for the Cardinal, is this is not – a Pac-12 game. They have plenty of opportunities between ranked Washington. They have a big win over Oregon, who looks like they're going to be ranked the rest of the year. The Pac-12 title game will be against a ranked opponent. Uh, so Stanford has still a shot to make it to the playoffs, but forget any of that potential unless their offensive line really – kicks it into a different gear because because right now it's not even a underperforming offensive line. It's straight up a bad offensive line. Yeah, it was it was pretty disappointing if you are a Cardinal fan here that they weren't able to get really anything going. And Bryce Love has just not been able to look you know, even a modicum of the same running back that he was last year. And I don't know if that's entirely on the offensive line or the play calling or what it is, but going forward, they need him. 
And I don't, I don't know what needs to happen in order to get him in gear, but you know, coach, you coach mentioned the offensive line and, you know, outside of Walker little, none of those guys have looked really good this season so far. All right. Well, with that, let's head over to the Big 12. And after blazing out to a 35 to 7 lead in the second quarter, West Virginia held off Texas Tech to win 42 to 34. Will Greer looked great again. And Coach GQ had to uh, replace Alan Bowman, who went down with a punctured lung with Jet Duffy. Uh, we'll see how Bowman is going forward. But Jet Duffy obviously brings more of a dual threat to that attack. So, Josh. Uh, my question for you is, coming into this weekend, we talked about your inherent skepticism of both of these coaches. Yeah. Uh, did either of them do anything on Saturday to change your opinion of either of them or of these teams? Look, I, I don't know if G- Coach GQ will work it all out, but Texas Tech just looks better than they ever have under his administration. West Virginia, though, th- this is a team that people have packed, have Big 12 title aspirations for some people had them as a sleeper to make the playoffs and I got to wonder why they are a team that barely held on when they had three takeaways this is a team that is sloppy 12 penalties 115 yards their rushing attack wasn't all that impressive against Texas Tech where's the scariness for Oklahoma Texas even looks better right now, and Texas is a team that I harp on all the time. Uh, I think West Virginia is dangerously close to the uh, the predictable Dana Holgerson slide, and they got Kansas next at home. Yeah, they'll probably win that one, and they'll look really good at 5-0, and but then they get a tough trip to Ames. And they have a tough trip to Texas. They host TCU, a team that I think is still dangerous. They head to Stillwater. They have Oklahoma. And there's a very good chance that this team wins about two more games the rest of the way. And it's because they're just not as good as their ranking would indicate. Coach, uh, what was your take from this one? Well, I I really love the fight from Texas Texas Tech. I, I think it was, you know, Texas Tech last year, year before that, they go down thirty-five to ten. It's fold up, ten, fold up tent, and you know you're seeing on the ticker ten minutes later, it's sixty-five to ten. And you know, I was very impressed, even losing your starting quarterback, going down to injury. I'll be honest, uh, when I saw that that Bowman was pulled, I thought he straight up got pulled. I didn't know that he had gone down with a, with a uh, collapsed lung. And yeah. I think he might still be in the hospital, actually. Yeah, and that's terrible. And so you're asking a lot, and I thought you were asking even way more than a lot with uh, with Jeff with Jet Duffy in saying, "Hey, all right, kid, you have to come and uh, you have to come in and, and and win this game for us." And and uh, I, I think you had to come back, back from that giant deficit. And you know, know what, Duffy looked pretty good. He did. I mean, he can, really run. he can definitely run, and Jet Duffy is a fantastic name. It is about as uh, Texas Tech of a name as you could possibly ever get. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Antoine Wesley uh, looked good. Um, I mean, I, I think it was, you know, I think for, for me the takeaway was, you know, West Virginia looked like West Virginia. You know, they look like they always do, and and I think Josh is spot on with his, with his assessment of the Mountaineers. Um I think Texas Tech is going to be a tough out. I, I think that Kingsbury is is finally heading in the right direction. I think he's finally got – I know 42 points uh, is kind of ironic when I say he's got the defense figured out, but um, they just – they look different. They're more resilient. They're fighting. They're, you know, they're a lot cleaner. And, and, and they're playing – they're just playing overall better. And when you have – and – that is not proven more than when a backup quarterback comes in and he can and he can still perform to the same level as as the starter. And that speaks not to the starting quarterback being bad. It speaks to, well, hey, this you know, every, all the the ten other guys are playing at at a high level, a high enough level for somebody else to step in and 
and not really skip a beat. So uh, I came away, again, much more impressed with Texas Tech uh, rather than, you know, saying, oh, West Virginia, you know, watch out here in the Big 12. You know, it, it's a tough ask to have anybody knock off Oklahoma right now unless you're Army. Definitely. All right. Well, uh, we will continue on with the ACC. Clemson was supposed to avenge their loss to Syracuse from last season with an exclamation point, seeing as it was Trevor Lawrence's first start. But the freshman phenom was knocked out of the game in the second quarter, and it was up to Chase Bryce to come in and save the day. And while it wasn't pretty, they were able to do so, mostly thanks to the legs of Travis Etienne. Uh, The Tigers ended up eking out a victory 27-23. to Josh, outside of being inundated with different shades of orange, my biggest takeaway from the game was how conservative Dino Babers got in the second half. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I agree. Um, and just one second, I gotta gotta do this for Clemson. <laughs> I told them uh, that team's not making the playoffs. <laughs> Coach. Have oh, we wait. lost the coach? No, you haven't. I, I just delivered the biggest, loudest, hardiest laugh. <laughs> and it was and it is kind of like if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody really hear it? <laughs> um, no, I, I I was like, you got to be kidding me. Of course this happens. Uh, and it was a it was a pretty, pretty bad shot, too, that Trevor Lawrence took. And, you know, uh, I saw Chase Bryce uh, in high school, playing in high school. He played for Grayson, uh, the Grayson Rams, I should say. Um, and, I mean, he, he played brilliantly down the stretch of, of that game and really kind of just, uh, you know, really kind of just put the team on his back and, and carried him. So, um, you know, Kelly Bryant's got to be got to be looking at his decision and be like, well, well, maybe I could have played. Maybe I could. I don't know. Maybe I should have stayed. I loved how that. I love how Twitter was uh, during halftime. It's like, oh, uh, can Kelly Bryant come back in? No, he was not. He was not on the active game day roster. He could not have come back in. But he is still enrolled at Clemson. Do we see well, Kelly Bryant? Maybe. Uh, no, you won't. To, the bridge is burned. I don't think. Well, Davos 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 said that that they welcome him back with open arms. He said, heck, yeah, I love that kid, was his exact quote. Mm -hmm. I think for for Kelly Bryant, the bridge is too far burned. But, I mean, look, I'm not laughing at Trevor Lawrence getting hurt. I'm not doing that. I'm laughing at the situation that Davos put himself into with making a very poor – coaching decision. Clemson's def- offensive line is not good enough for a Tua type statue pocket passer. Uh, Syracuse has one of the by reputation one of the worst defensive lines in the ACC and well, Syracuse manufactured four sacks, six tackles for loss. They got a quarterback hurry, and I just don't see this Clemson team holding up against, if they so are fortunate to make it to the playoffs, a top-level team. And, you know, everyone wants to talk about schedules and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. Uh, There's a very real chance that Clemson ends the season without having faced a ranked opponent. All year. They didn't have one scheduled at all. Florida State's no longer ranked and will never be ranked again this season. NC State right now is their only ranked team, and you're banking on the Wolfpack remaining at 23rd for the next two weeks? Yeah, maybe they'll get, like, Miami in the title game and they'll be ranked. Maybe? Yeah. So, um, this is just not a... Gary Clemson team. They have a fantastic defensive line. Outside of that, I'm struggling to see how Clemson is separate from any other blue blood program right now. And, uh, you know, in my own poll, I've got Clemson pretty far down there. I've got Clemson at seventh. 
um, because I don't think they have enough offense to hang with Bama, Ohio State, Georgia, Oklahoma, Central Florida. Or even and, Notre Dame. I mean, if no. Notre Dame finishes undefeated, I, I think Notre Dame's better than at this point. No. And, and I mean, like, sure, give, give Dabo some credit for making the announcement in time for Kelly Bryant to transfer, but if – Dabo Sweeney had a better handle on his own team right now, he'd realize he doesn't have a good enough offensive line to play a less mobile quarterback. He needs Kelly Bryant. So one thing I want to say, Travis Etienne was amazing in this game. Travis Etienne uh, is the next of a slew of this class of sophomore running backs that I think has a chance to go down in history as the greatest running back class of all time, the high school class of 2017. We've got Travis Etienne, Jonathan Taylor, uh, uh, DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, Najee Harris. The list goes on and on and on. I think that this class of running backs is you know, one of the greatest that we've ever seen already and only has a chance to go up from there. Coach, I mean, you, you're our recruit, Nick. I, I'm sure I'm missing a couple guys, but – these these now sophomores, uh, AJ Dillon from Boston College, all these guys have been absolutely outstanding. Yeah, they they absolutely have. I mean, you know, you you look countrywide. I mean, it's just impressive. And you know, Etienne is is right there amongst that group. And you know, Dillon and Swift and Cam Akers and Najee Harris and that whole crew. I mean, they're they're really you know, the running back position. It's it's. This class is pretty loaded. Yeah, it, it running back is, you know, might be a, a secondary position on the NFL, but it is alive and well in college football, which makes me happy. Well, it's so. repurposed, really. Absolutely, yeah. Because, I mean, you, you see guys now that are much more involved in the passing game, and it's not just, you know, the, the traditional bell cow who's going to get 300 carries for, you know, you know, uh, f- five yards of pop, three clouds and three yards in a cloud of dust kind of thing. You see guys that are super versatile and can line up at multiple positions across the field. So, all right, with that, let's head back to the SEC in Stark Vegas. Florida won the Dan Mullen Bowl in a game that was anything but watchable. The Gators got the victory by the count of 13-6, to six, but neither team looked impressive at all. The only touchdown in the game was scored on a trick play, and quite frankly, I'm just glad I was not there to witness it. Coach, is there anything we can actually learn from this result? Yeah, Cowboys are – Cowboys. Cowbells are really loud. Um, I mean, Mississippi State is – starting to Mississippi State is kind of the is starting to become the West Virginia of the SEC preseason everybody's like oh it's 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 time for Mississippi State here they go and then they disappoint you oh here's Mississippi State it's time for them to then they disappoint Florida same way now you know Florida oh Florida's back they're recruiting so well they finally got a quarterback no 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 they don't Felipe Franks he ain't good, folks. It ain't pretty. He threw for 219 yards, um, but he just – I just have to say that, you know, um, when Coach Moorhead said it's very frustrating, I could I could see that. Um, you know, their, their offense was just discombobulated, unorganized, just – Seemed to lack any sort of fire intensity. They couldn't block a soul. They couldn't complete a pass. They couldn't do diddly poo on offense. I'm quoting Jim Mora for the <laughs> or keeping score at home. But uh, I mean, let's you know, you look at the stats. You look at the team stats. You know, you've got Mississippi State 98 yards passing, 104 rushing. They had. 202, that's total 202. They were 2 of 12 on third down. That doesn't help. They had zero turnovers, which is even more troubling. They only had two penalties for 15 yards, which makes it even worse. Uh, Florida had 11 for 90. Florida turned the ball over once. Florida held the ball. It was pretty, it was fairly even. There wasn't a great 
dispersity and time of possession. Florida was 5 of 14. You know, Florida had 118 yards rushing, so it's not like they ran the ball that much significantly better. They just threw the ball significantly better because they hit a few big plays. But Felipe Franks was just bad. You know, I, I just – it honestly, I, I use this term – uh, sometimes 13 to 6 games are fun to watch because you have two great defenses that are playing against offenses you know are truly good. They're just game planned well against. This was definitely not one of those games. This was this was ugly on all counts. Um, and so Florida hosts LSU. That'll be a beatdown. Uh, Mississippi State hosts Auburn. That'll kind of be a competitive game because Auburn is uh, pretty dreadful up front on the offensive side of the ball. But It'll be ugly for Mississippi State because I don't think there's a team that's blocked Auburn's defensive line yet. So, oof. it's about to get it's about to go from bad to worse for these two programs. Definitely, uh, Josh. You know, is, is there anything that you can you can you know get out of this game, or is this just sort of okay? Th- this was basically a 50-50 game. Florida ends up winning, but we don't really know that much more about either team. Well, I, I think we got to look at what in the world Moorhead is doing to this Mississippi State offense. Um, he's an offensive genius, without a doubt. His track record at Penn State speaks for itself. But I'm wondering, he inherited this you know, fringe Heisman Trophy candidate, this dual threat Nick Fitzgerald kid running all these RPOs, you know, running all these read plays. I would just tell Nick, hey, dude, either you start handing the ball off more or I'm just going to call design runs because Kalen Hill, Mississippi State's running back, he's not that bad. And he's shown flashes in that big win at Kansas State, 211 yards on 17 carries. Since that game, in their last three games, he has just 19 carries. He had four in the loss to Kentucky and nine against Florida for 41 yards. Fitzgerald cannot do it alone. And so I think Moorhead needs to, like I said, pull him aside and say, hey, Nick, either you start handing that ball off, or I'm just calling designed runs because pretty much every SEC defense is just going to say, Hey, what's number seven doing? And they're going to ignore all the other bulldogs. And then you get what Florida did. You get what Kentucky did. And before you know it, you're not even making a bowl game. All right. Well, let's do our final game of the week then. Uh, In what was one of the most shocking scores of the weekend, Virginia Tech absolutely stomped on Duke 31 to 14. Ryan Willis filling in for the injured Josh Jackson was an absolute revelation at quarterback. He had 332 yards, three touchdowns, and zero picks. Josh, what happened to the (laughs) Dukie on Saturday? Well, I think the big thing is Duke's been really opportunistic on defense, having uh, some timely takeaways. And, you know, for instance, against Northwestern, they won the turnover margin two to nothing. And on Saturday, they didn't take anything away from Virginia Tech. And then they had a giveaway themselves. And Duke's a nice team, but, uh, you know, they can't lose the turnover battle. That's, that's going to be dangerous for Duke. Um, Duke also needs to get a little bit more of a running game. Uh, Virginia Tech did a nice job of holding them to just two yards per carry. But in our pre-show meeting, the whole reason I wanted to even talk about this game, guys, is Duke was ranked last week 22nd, and I had them also ranked 22nd. But I was crunching the numbers, gentlemen, and I actually still have Duke ranked. And, in fact, I have Duke up or actually I have Duke at the exact same spot, 22nd. And the reason I do is they are one of the few teams in the nation, since we're still so early in the season, to have two road victories against Power 5 teams. And Duke's wins combined of FBS opponents, I throw out FCS when I'm tabulating these numbers, but 
Duke right now, their Division One wins, their top Division One FBS wins, have combined to go seven and seven, which that doesn't sound that great. But for instance, Florida's wins are a combined six and nine. Oklahoma State's are a combined six and eight. Washington State's are a combined two and nine. So am I crazy for keeping Duke ranked in a game where it's Daniel Jones's first game back from injury? Um, There's still have those two power five road wins. Their wins are not terrible. They're 500. Like, am I insane for doing that in my poll, you guys? I don't think you're insane. I just, this is pretty bad to me, losing to Virginia Tech in such a resounding fashion. I mean, especially without Josh Jackson. I'm, I, I was pretty astonished at the the level of control Virginia Tech seemed to have throughout this game, Coach. Yeah, I mean, it's – I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know what to make of this game. Um, you know, Virginia Tech offense, they they did it with a backup. You know, the, Josh Jackson went, went down and, you know, Ryan Willis came in. And Ryan Willis is a transfer from Kansas. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So – this one, this win is actually on David Beatty because he prepared Ryan Willis <laughs> so well uh, that you know they went into Duke and they were he was used to he was so at home playing in a high school stadium that he <laughs> he just went off on uh, on Duke and uh, I think Wallace Wade Stadium might have a track, you guys. Well, I, think I mean, there you have it. <laughs> I, I think that answers all the questions that we had about this game. <laughs> they had a track. Um, but, yeah, no, the Virginia Tech, looked, honestly, they looked like what we thought they were going to look like um, preseason. You know, they totaled 631 yards. They gave, they gave up 631 total yards and seven touchdowns uh, at Old Dominion. They didn't, they didn't look like that. Um, you know, they, they cut that in half, obviously. Um, they looked a lot better. They looked a lot more in sync on offense. Defense was flying around like they were. They had something to prove, which they actually did have something to prove. So, um, you know, hats off to Bud Foster for, for turning this thing around and, and going on the road and beating a ranked opponent, even if that ranked opponent is Duke and they're not traditionally a p- college football powerhouse and, and shouldn't be, you know, College football traditionalists will say you shouldn't thump your chest about beating the Duke Blue Devils, but they're ranked and they're well coached and they do everything really well. And that's kind of what a David Cutcliffe team does. They're very thorough. You, know, you, you could tell it in his if you just listen to Dave Cutcliffe talk about talk to Peyton Manning, you could you, you know exactly how he's going to coach his teams. Every little single detail matters and. That adds up. So, uh, again, I think I'm going to use that C word again. They have culture. They have really good culture. They have a really good mature football team. You know, they have a team that, you know, there's a reason why they're ranked. And Virginia Tech came back and they played like they should have played all year. And they took control of this game. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us here today. Josh, any final thoughts? Yeah, and I cannot believe we've done this for yet another show somehow, but we buried the lead. Did and we? yeah, that is that is Arkansas. And Arkansas had one hell of a gem, you guys. They held Texas AM to 377 yards, made their day miserable on third down, had two takeaways. So Arkansas improving, but there's one minor issue, and this is a sport that has, believe it or not, three phases. Oh. And, um, Wait, yeah, and, and Arkansas gave up the opening kickoff for a 100-yard touchdown return. And so Arkansas, their special teams efficiency, they gave up that return to North Texas, the famous one, where the kid didn't call a fair catch. They gave up this return. 
So believe it or not, Arkansas is no longer in the top 10 of special team efficiency. They, they've slipped a little bit to 121st. <laughs> and I think that third phase is just uh, not where the Razorbacks need it to be for them to climb out of this hole and knock off Alabama, knock off uh, some of these top level SEC opponents. All right. Coach, any final words from you? I don't really know how I wanna uh how I wanna follow that, but um I'm on rivals dot com right now and I'm watching a looped clip of the Rivals Camp series and they do this cat and mouse drill and some kid in an effort to elude the tackler did some sort of break dancing move where he slid on the ground and did some like helicopter move, got up, did the Fred Flintstone twinkle toes and then uh, bursted full speed to to his right, to, to the far right cone. And he didn't make it. <laughs> um, so that's real football in a nutshell, because uh, doesn't every running back do uh, break dance in the open field before, you know, as they're trying to score? I think the only person who can pull it off these days is Benny Snell. Probably. <laughs> I, they probably would be scared to call it. Um so uh, on a serious note, um, you know it's getting it's getting going from bad to worse with for DJ Durkin. Uh, the Washington Post has come out uh, with some new allegations that have emerged against Maryland football and head coach DJ Durkin. Uh, investigation dating back six weeks now. Uh, there is uh, investigators uncovered a number of tales of a players of players falling into a deep depression. Um, and one of those is a mother who said she reached out to Maryland administration with concerns all the way back to December of 2016. So this is showing their administration's negligence, um, to the situation. Um, so the letter also including allegations, he was heading up valorous suffering of football athletes that he allows his coaches to psychologically, physically, and emotionally abuse the athletes. And so it's opening the door to a bunch of civil lawsuits and things like that. So um, I, don't, I don't know how he's still just on administrative leave now. He has not been fired yet. They're just trying to gather all of the information. Um, I, I guarantee you what they're trying to do is uh, they're trying to figure out a way. They're trying to get as much evidence as they possibly can to be able to terminate him with, with just cause and not have to uh, – not have to pay him any sort of buyout and and not be fearful of any sort of appeal. They're trying to eliminate all of those options uh, in one fell swoop and uh, not have to go on and say, oh, he's going to appeal and then lose the appeal and cost him more money. They're just going to they're just going to essentially just just get it all in one one shot. All right. Well, on that note, we're going to have to end it for tonight. So, on behalf of our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton, here in the Music City, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in the Windy City. This is the professor in Nashville saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Don't bury the lead. Pig suey. Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion.